Hello everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we are going to be doing a super exciting video. We are going to be talking about endometriosis. What is it? What are the symptoms? And a little bit extra information about endometriosis and some resources down below. So if you don't know, March is Endometriosis Awareness Month and yellow is the color of endometriosis awareness. So today we're gonna to be diving into endometriosis, going into all the details, but before that, remember to hit the subscribe button down below, hit the notification bell so you are notified every time I upload a new video. Give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoy it, and leave me a comment down below with what your questions are about endometriosis. And also follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, social media in general to stay up to date with what I'm doing. So, Without more rambling, let's get into the video. So what is endometriosis? Endometriosis is basically when endometrial-like tissue, so tissue that is similar to the one that grows inside the uterus, is growing outside of the uterus. And this can be anywhere outside the uterus. There have been case reports of endometriosis found in the lungs, in the brain, in the diaphragm, everywhere, almost everywhere in the body except the spleen. So it's fairly common. It is estimated that it affects two to 10% of American women between the ages of 25 and 40. But in reality, the statistics for this are really hard to decipher. One, because a lot of people are misdiagnosed. It takes about seven to nine years worldwide to get a diagnosis of endometriosis. And then it's also difficult because women with endometriosis may never have symptoms, so we never know that they actually do have it or they don't have the traditional symptoms, I should say. A lot of women with endometriosis are more likely to have infertility or difficulty getting pregnant. And like I said, it takes an average of seven years for most women to get a diagnosis. Basically, what happens with endometriosis is that during the regular menstrual cycle, and if you have questions about the menstrual cycle, I have a video talking all about what is normal and what is not normal. I will link it over here in the cards. But basically, what happens during the normal menstrual cycle? So during the menstrual cycle, the endometrium that is inside the uterus responds to estrogen and all the other hormones and it grows and grows and grows. And then if you don't get pregnant, that tissue is shed at the end of the month. Now, women with endometriosis have tissue that responds to these hormones in the similar fashion. I did forget to mention that endometriosis has been found to have the ability to produce its own estrogen and that's why even in situations that you get the uterus or the ovaries out and even after menopause it can still recur because it doesn't respond to suppressing the body's own estrogen. And it looks and acts like endometrial tissue. It grows outside the uterus and all the other organs and then when it's time for the menstrual cycle to come out, it doesn't because it has nowhere to go. So it just stays inside the body and causes inflammation, it causes inflammatory changes and reactions, it causes pain, and then it causes, it creates a chain-like reaction where things keep going and happening every single month and keeps building up until you know you start having the typical symptoms of endometriosis so that leads to inflammation swelling and scarring of the normal tissue that surrounds these implants and then that's what causes all the issues so there's different types of endometriosis and the clinical presentation of all of these are very different from patient to patient and how you will be treated is generally based on symptoms and fertility status. The four most common types of endometriosis are superficial or peritoneal endometriosis. You have deep infiltrating endometriosis. You have ovarian endometriosis and you also have abdominal wall endometriosis. So superficial endometriosis is usually the one that we hear about the most is usually looks a certain way although research has shown and experienced surgeons have published out there that endometriosis can look a myriad of ways and it doesn't always look the traditional way that we are used to seeing it in textbooks and in common patients but women who do have infertility and are suspected to have minimal or mild endometriosis surgery is recommended usually endometriosis is a histological diagnosis so that means 
that when your surgeon goes and takes a piece of the tissue that looks like it might have endometriosis, the pathologist confirms the diagnosis and tells you, yes, there's endometriosis there. Now, sadly, there's a lot of people that don't undergo surgery for one reason or another, or also maybe they haven't had surgery yet and they don't want to undergo surgery yet. So there are ways to do clinical diagnosis, but the actual, the gold standard, what we call it, is to have a surgery with a tissue diagnosis. So ovarian endometriosis is what we normally hear people call endometriomas. It's basically an implant that forms or attaches itself to the ovary and then it kind of grows like a cyst but then it grows every month and bleeds every month and grows every month and bleeds every month, right? So then it accumulates blood and old blood we all know that looks kind of brownish color. So usually when we look at these cysts during the surgery, they have a chocolate-like appearance. It sounds a little bit gross, I know, but it is what it is, that is what we call it, and we call them chocolate cysts or endometriomas. Basically what women with endometriomas should have done is have a cystectomy, which is a surgery where we remove the cyst, including the capsule, to kind of prevent the recurrence of the cyst. Now, deep infiltrating endometriosis, or DEI, is usually the one that is a little bit harder sometimes to see or that causes most of the problems. Um, basically, it creates nodules, which are like basically firm. They usually form in the rectovaginal space, in the bladder, in the pelvic nerves, in the ureter, in the bowel, and those areas. And these lesions can be multifocal and they can cause a myriad of problems. Usually these are the ones that cause a lot of dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, um, dyskitsia, rectal bleeding, and all of that. So dysmenorrhea is pain with periods. Dyspareunia is pain with intercourse and dyskitsia is pain with bowel movements. So now you're starting to hear some of the symptoms that women with endometriosis tend to have. So currently the recommendation by ACOG is that the definitive treatment for pain associated with deep infiltrating endometriosis is hysterectomy with or without bilateral self and go -ophorectomy in women that do not desire future fertility, um, that have intractable pelvic pain at nexal masses or previous conservative surgical procedures. There is some controversy currently in the endometriosis community because expert endometriosis surgeons know that even with hysterectomy and even with removing the ovaries and the tubes, which is what selpingo-wolfarectomy means, still doesn't resolve the problem. And what is recommended in the um, endometriosis community is basically surgical resection of all the implants or of every area that looks like it might have endometriosis. And it's a little bit of extreme surgery, but it does have good outcomes in patients in terms of recurrence, pain relief, and fertility. Observational studies suggest that in patients with advanced endometriosis, surgical resection of the deep implants can improve pregnancy rates for up to 45%. So what causes endometriosis? So the true causes of endometriosis, they're not really known. We don't really know what causes endometriosis. There's multiple theories and multiple theories that are combined and accepted in the OBGYN and in the endometriosis community. So one of the theories suggests that during menstruation, some of the tissue goes through the tubes and then into the abdomen and they call it reverse menstruation and then that tissue attaches into new places and that's why it grows. Another theory is that it can travel through the blood and the lymph lymphatic vessels and then it can implant in different places, kind of like cancer does. Um, and this theory is kind of hit or miss. There hasn't been that much evidence, but it can explain how it can get to the brain and lungs and other areas where it has been found. A third theory is that basically any cell in the body can suddenly have, you know, changes in gene expression and then transform into an endometrial cell. Another reason that endometriosis can occur is like direct transplantation. So like during a C-section, if the endometrium is exposed to the outside of the uterus, then it can start to grow in the C-section scar and then 
you know, expand from there. But there's also evidence that shows that there is genetic factors that are associated with endometriosis and that there is a genetic component. So if you have family members that have endometriosis, that does increase the chances of you yourself having endometriosis as well. One of the main theories, and that is the one that is used by endometriosis specialists across the world, is mullerianosis. They think something called a chorostoma is, which is a mass of tissue that is normal, but that is not normally found in the organ or structure in which it's located, and then that becomes endometriosis. Usually this tissue is composed of endometrial glands and stroma, but that's pretty much where the similarity ends. So that's kind of what they're thinking, and that sounds really confusing, and I completely understand that. Um, I'll see if I can link some videos down below or some images where you can kind of read a little bit more about Mullerian theory. So what are the risk factors? So any woman or person out there, because not only women suffer from endometriosis, there have been men and trans cisgendered individuals that suffer endometriosis, um, if they have a first degree relative, so a mother, a father, a sister, um, a daughter with endometriosis, then they have an increased risk of having endometriosis. Women who are having their first baby after the age of 30 and women who have uterine abnormalities. Some of the symptoms of endometriosis, I have mentioned them before, but the most common one is pelvic pain. So this means pain during your periods, pain outside of your menstrual period and pain with intercourse, abnormal or heavy menstrual flow, infertility, painful urination during your period, painful bowel movements during your period, other GI problems like diarrhea, constipation, nausea, vomiting during your periods. Um, like I mentioned before, the gold standard for diagnosis of endometriosis is a tissue biopsy after surgery, but there are other methods that can find signs associated with endometriosis. So there's specific ultrasounds, uh, ultrasound protocols that can be used to evaluate for endometriosis. So there's something called the sliding sign, which they do special um, assessments during an ultrasound to see if things move in association with one another and it's highly predictive of endometriosis. Having a CT scan that shows an endometrioma or a nodule in um, an area close to the pelvis that can um, be an indicative of endometriosis and also sometimes you can see endometriosis nodules on MRI. The most common findings on imaging are endometriomas, adhesions, and deeper superficial nodules. So what are the treatment options? The availability of treatment options is immense. So one of the things that we can do, and it's what I did for a long time, was watchful waiting. Basically observe how the disease progresses. You can use pain medication like um, NSAIDs, which would be like ibuprofen, Motrin, over-the-counter analgesics. Um, those medications can help. You can use hormonal therapy to help with some of the symptoms. So using oral contraceptive pills that have estrogen and progestin um, prevent ovulation and then in theory it suppresses the endometrial tissue but this doesn't work for everybody so you have to figure out which treatment modality works the best for you. You can use progestins alone. So using the progestin pill, an IUD, a Nexplanon. So medications like Lupron and Oralissa are medications that suppress hormone release from the brain and basically estrogen and progesterone from being produced which in theory should suppress the tissue from growing and decrease the symptoms of endometriosis for many many years. It does work for some people in terms of symptom relief but it has side effects like menopause like symptoms, osteoporosis and other things that make it a little bit tricky so it's kind of losing popularity in terms of treatment options and it's usually kind of a last resort. Oralissa is a GnRH antagonist so it blocks the receptor it doesn't allow the hormone to work how it's supposed to. Now this is a newer medication and it is approved for treatment of pain specifically. Confession time, I am currently on this medication. I decided to start it because my pain was getting really out of control and I needed to be able to work. 
Uh, I'm a resident and our hours are crazy. Sometimes I spend all day in the OR and I couldn't just be bending over in pain. So that's why I decided to start the medication. It does have side effects. It also puts you kind of into menopause. It gives you hot flashes, um, night sweats. It can cause osteoporosis. So you have to take a calcium and vitamin D supplement and then you kind of have to watch your side effects to see if there's anything that could be concerning, which would be problems with your liver or anything like that. Luckily, I haven't had that many side effects. I just occasionally get hot flashes and it really hasn't been that bad. It's not for everybody and it's something that you need to decide with your doctor if you want to do it or not. Now, there is some evidence that this doesn't really slow down the disease progression or doesn't reverse the lesions. It's purely symptomatic relief. It, um, it helps to decrease the pain with your periods and also pain with intercourse for some people. So what is the management? And like I mentioned before, the gold standard is laparoscopy with excision of endometriosis. It's also called lapex. And the best way to do this would be with um, an experienced surgeon, someone who does a lot of endometriosis surgery and has had good success in terms of treating the disease. A lot of infertility specialists are also trained in endometriosis resection and they can do your surgery for you as well. There, previous, in previous times, there was a lot of treatment with what they call ablation, which is burning off the lesions versus resection or excision. Um, there has been a systematic review and meta-analysis that uh, with limited evidence at 12 months post-surgery, pelvic pain with periods, pelvic pain with bowel movements, and chronic pelvic pain secondary to endometriosis um, show significantly greater improvement after excision compared to ablation. And then in a prospective controlled randomized double-blind study, surgical therapy has been shown to be superior to expectant management after treatment of mild and moderate endometriosis. Another of the issues with endometriosis is infertility. The mechanisms of how endometriosis causes infertility is not completely known, but some of the things that we can think of is like, it distorts the anatomy of the pelvis with the adhesions, the scarring of the fallopian tubes because of all the inflammation, an altered immune system because your body is constantly in an inflammatory state, the hormonal environment of your reproductive tract, impaired implantation, and alteration of egg quality because of inflammation. There was a study that showed that in patients with minimal and mild pelvic endometriosis, um, excision of the endometriosis implants increased pregnancy rates and this was also seen for patients with severe endometriosis. One of the things that I learned during my journey the past few months with endometriosis, I've gotten really really into it even though I already was before, is that endometriosis can also be seen in 2-5% to of postmenopausal women with chronic pelvic pain. The progression of postmenopausal endometriosis could be related to extra ovarian production of estrogen like in fat in your adrenal glands. Um, it was seen that these lesions remained active with proliferative activity and preserved hormonal responsiveness even in low estrogen environments. Basically why is this important and the reason I was looking down a lot is because I made a presentation about all of these things so I was kind of reading through some of the data that I found and this is very important because as OBGYNs, as generalists, we will have many patients that come to us for evaluation of pelvic pain and it's important to identify which of these patients could have endometriosis. It's better to err on the side of caution in my mind and be a little bit more open and just assume someone who has really bad periods and has the, all these other symptoms has endometriosis than to assume that they have anything else so that we can refer them to a more experienced surgeon or we can um, diagnose them surgically or at least give them options for their pain management in a timely manner instead of waiting for them to see multiple providers in order to get a proper diagnosis. So we should be obtaining full gynecological history and we should counsel the patient and give them all of the treatment alternatives for management and diagnosis, including surgery. Treatment is definitely not one size fits all. My own personal experience has been all over the place and it is okay to try different things and find 
what works for you, but also it's important to advocate for yourself, ask a patient and say, hey, this is not working, like I wanna to move towards surgery or I wanna be referred to someone who has more experience in the subject. So patients who are also experiencing infertility, they may benefit from consulting with a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist or seeing an expert um, endometriosis surgeon. Postmenopausal patients, especially those who are on hormonal replacement therapy uh, that present with signs and symptoms of endometriosis, they should not be disregarded as something else. We should think that this is also a possibility and spread the knowledge that postmenopausal endometriosis is real and advocate for yourself as well. As OBGYNs, as medical students, as providers in general, we need to advocate for patients because these patients suffer in silence and we need to help attempt to improve their quality of life. Patients do deserve to know that the medical management is aimed at symptoms and not necessarily slow the disease process and make the decision if they do want to proceed with surgery or they want to wait. So my personal experience with endometriosis, I've had symptoms since I was about 15 or 16 years old. I'm currently on the Mirena IUD and Orton Oralissa for treatment of my symptoms and my pain. I'm currently doing a lot better than I was back in the summer when I was having a lot of flare episodes and a lot of pain and I was just not having a great time. Currently in the process of considering if I want to have surgery or not so I will definitely keep you guys posted and take you along with me if that is something that I end up doing. But if you have any other questions about endometriosis or you want to spread awareness, please check out the links I will leave in the description box down below. Leave me a comment down below. Wear yellow during the month of March and spread love for all those people that suffer in silence. So that is it for this video. I feel like I have been talking for forever and a day. I will leave you all and see you in my next video. Bye guys.